So, uh, perhaps we ought to get started uh, for our second panel, which is on uh, the LIBOR case, which is a private index that's used in the public service. Um, it stands for the London Interbank Offered Rate, and it is the rate at which um, a surveyed bank believed that it could borrow at the reasonable size in prevailing markets. Um, I think 16 banks worldwide are surveyed as to what it would cost them to borrow uh, money, um, uh, short-term money. The high end and the low end are thrown out, and so you get the um, uh, the average of the uh, remaining um, banks in the pool. There obviously have been widespread allegations that the LIBOR rate was um, not correctly reported, um, sometimes by banks that sought to give a uh, false signal of their um, uh, financial health. Uh, sometimes by banks for the benefit of uh, a, a given trader's book, um, which would lose or gain depending upon what the LIBOR rate reported was. Um, the LIBOR rate is, as I said earlier, maybe the most important number in the world, so it's said, because trillions of dollars are financial products for consumers, for um, uh, large commercial firms for derivatives are uh, float in effect um, in accordance with what the LIBOR rate is or are otherwise set in accordance with the LIBOR rate. The question as to what to do about um, the admitted evidence of manipulation is a troubling one. Press reports as to um, enforcement actions against banks, Barclays Bank and others, um, with large fines, criminal actions brought against some, and private litigation, uh, about which we're going to hear uh, more in short order. So today's panel, um, exceptionally distinguished, um, consists of, of sort of um, uh, private attorneys and professors of law discussing this issue from their different perspectives. Uh, Steve Feynman and Michael Gass, Steve, Michael, um, have been involved in thinking through these questions from, I'd say, the litigator's perspective um, in a theoretical sense and a procedural sense. Um, uh, Steve is managing partner at uh, Leaf Cabraser, um, and that's to some extent perspective he brings on these things. Um, uh, Michael is, is head of, of securities litigation and the governance group at Choke Hall in Stewart, um, and has also been involved in the litigation, perhaps from a different perspective. So they're going to talk first. And then uh, thinking to, to help us think about whether an index such as the LIBOR index, given how it's created um, or how it ought to be created, um, how it might serve these ends, uh, Dan, Dan Dan Ari, who's on the law faculty at Oxford, and Andrew Verstein, who's um, law faculty at Wake Forest, have each written on this question in very interesting ways. And, and um, I commend to you their work on SSRN which is where these things are posted. Um, and so I think we'll, we'll, we'll have a broad range of perspectives, both from those who have to deal with uh, um, uh, solutions that the litigation system might provide, and those who will help us think in broader ways as to whether an index such as this um, uh, can actually work, and if not, how um, it might be changed. So um, with that brief introduction, uh, let me introduce um, Stephen Feynman. Good morning. I'm glad to be here again. Um, I think I've been at 
almost all of the global justice conferences, going back to the first one that Bob did uh, in Paris uh, many years ago. Um, and I'm glad to see so many familiar faces, people I've worked with over the years uh, here, including some people here who know more, I think, about the subject I'm going to address than I do. Um, but I'm going to give it a shot. Um, what I've been asked to do is to give you sort of the lay of the land procedurally of where the civil litigation is uh, in the United States involving LIBOR. Um, I just want to circle back for one moment uh, and address the way that LIBOR is set because it is important in uh, talking about uh, the kinds of cases that have been brought. Um, at the relevant time period, uh, there were 16 banks from around the world uh, who submitted uh, their daily borrowing quote uh, to Thomson Reuters, who had been acting on behalf of um, the, the British Bankers Association, uh, with respect to US dollar LIBOR. Um, the cases that we're talking about, in the, that I'm talking about, are involved US dollar, dollar LIBOR. Um, the, the BBA, um, uh, through the BBA, LIBOR was set for um, many currencies around the world um, by some of the same banks and other banks. Uh, the litigation in the U.S. involves U.S. dollar LIBOR. Um, uh, the banks were supposed to submit on a daily basis at 11 o'clock every day, uh, secretly, uh, whatever they, uh, their borrowing costs are uh, over different maturities, um, short-term maturities. Um, other banks were not supposed to know what the quotes, uh, daily borrowing quotes were. Um, the, um, as, as you heard, um, referred to, there are settlements, government settlements already achieved uh, following government investigations by the Department of Justice, the CFTC, the SEC, the British FCA, the Swiss Authority, the German Authority, and Japan, uh, with uh, settlements with Barclays, UBS, and RBS. The Barclays settlement generated uh, a fair bit of information that was contained in uh, or, uh, settlement orders that suggests that there are two fraudulent regimes. Uh, one fraudulent regime has to do with the manipulation of LIBOR up and down to suit the interests of specific traders' positions at the different banks. That is not the principal basis of the civil litigation. Um, you can imagine, uh, just from a practical standpoint, the difficulty in establishing damages in a case where, damage, where LIBOR is moving up and down on a daily basis. The theory of the civil litigation uh, it has to do with the second fraudulent, regi fraudulent regime that we've seen in the uh, government <laughs> proceedings. And that has to do with the suppression of LIBOR during the financial crisis period, um, r roughly summer of 2007 through summer of 2009, or late 2009. And the theory of this case is that the banks, uh, on their own and in conspiracy with one another, uh, agreed to submit artificially low borrowing quotes to the BBA, knowing that that would in turn result in a suppressed LIBOR, which would in turn result in interest rates that were part of LIBOR-based instruments being uh, lower than they should have been. It's the simplest way to, to, to explain what the case is. Um, <coughs> the civil litigation in the United States really got started in uh, the summer of 2011. Um, uh, my firm represents uh, numerous Schwab entities. Um, we also represent a number of other uh, private financial institutions, but they have not filed lawsuits yet. Um, the Schwab entities filed law their lawsuits in August of 2011. Our cases are not class cases. Our cases are based on the um, alleged harm suffered uh, by uh, the Schwab entities, mutual funds and the corporate side. Um, and our, our case asserts this suppression of LIBOR during the relevant time period. Um, there, uh, the cases in the United States were all coordinated before a single federal judge. Again, these cases are primarily involving the suppression of LIBOR during this relevant financial crisis period. The cases uh, were all coordinated here in New York before uh, Judge Naomi Reese Buckwell <coughs> as part of our multi-district litigation system. Um, in the early stages of the litigation, in addition to the Schwab cases, there were three uh, different class cases filed. 
Um, there was called the over-the-counter class, there was something called an exchange-based class, and there's something called a bondholder class. The theories of, of the legal theories asserted in all of these cases uh, included claims for violation of federal antitrust laws, uh, included uh, civil RICO claims, and a number of common law uh, theories of liability, uh, including uh, unjust enrichment, breach of the covenant of good faith and fair dealing, interference with business advantage, common law fraud. Um, all of these, these, these cases uh, were before the judge and she uh, entertained what are called motions to dismiss. Most of you know what those are. Um, those of you who don't, those are efforts by the defendants to have the cases dismissed on legal grounds at the very outset of the litigation. The court stayed while the motions to dismiss in these original filed cases were being addressed, the court stayed the litigation of the dozens of other cases that have been filed, uh, almost all of which are class cases, but not entirely. Um, earlier this year in the spring, Judge Buckwald uh, issued a decision uh, dismissing the federal antitrust claims. Um, Mike's going to talk more about the uh, reasons for that and the challenges for that, and I may come back to it a little bit later. But um, she dismissed the civil antitrust claims, the federal anti antitrust claims, as well as Schwab's state law antitrust claim. She also dismissed the federal RICO claim. She per is permitting, uh, at least at the time being, a commodities claim, and uh, it would appear certain state law claims, although there are still motions pending as to those as well. The Federal antitrust claims um, were dismissed on a, uh, based on the uh, conclusion that the judge reached that there was no antitrust injury. Um, I'm not going to get into the details of antitrust law right now, in part because I'm not an antitrust lawyer, but also because um, Mike's going to address some of that, and I'll, I can circle back in a little bit and talk about it. But it's a very a relatively narrow issue that she dismissed on, and it's before the Second Circuit Court of Appeals right now. Um, she also dismissed the civil RICO claim that Schwab, uh, that Schwab brought. And I just want to, given the, the global nature of our, our meeting here today, I want to comment on one aspect of her decision. Uh, she dismissed RICO, civil RICO in part on the grounds that we were seeking an extraterritorial application of civil RICO. Um, on the theory that because this is the uh, London Interbank Operate Rate and the British Bankers Association, that the case and the fraud occurred in London or in England. And um, that's not the case. The, bank, the BBA member banks here are from all over the world. They're from the United States, they're from London, they're from Germany, they're from Japan, they're from Canada, they're from Switzerland. Um, and the decisions made to uh, submit low rates, artificially low rates, were, were made be assert in those places, not in London. But it's something to pay attention to because it's going to be an issue uh, on appeal as well. Um, the, the, uh, so that is, that is pretty much the, 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 the lay of the land at the moment. There is some state court litigation as well. Um, and uh, stay tuned uh, for what happens in the Second Circuit. Um, there's been no discovery uh, yet in these cases. Uh, before Judge Buckwald, uh, there was, the cases are not progressing at the moment while the uh, procedural aspects of the cases are sorted out. Um, so that, that's where things stand. Um, I think Mike's going to talk about some of the specific legal issues and um, I'll probably circle back in a little bit and talk about those further. Uh, so I'm going to pick up on a theme that was addressed by the last panel in the mortgage-backed securities uh, context, and particularly uh, Bill and Jeff touched on, which is inherent constraints within the uh, civil litigation uh, world to actually get redress for these wrongs. And just to put a, this a little bit in context, um, the, the behavior uh, that's being alleged in the LIBOR cases is really bad. Uh, in, in the mortgage-backed securities context, there's a lot of negligence, a lot of recklessness, and arguably some intentional misbehavior. Um, in LIBOR, it's all intentional. I mean, these people lied. They were asked what they thought their borrowing rate, rate was, and they gave a different rate. And they were able to do that because the information that they were being asked about was not based on actual transactions, but what, on, what they thought that they could borrow at. 
and, and they gave information that was different from that based on their own individual interests. So we're talking about really bad behavior, fraud, you know, and, and, and illegal in, you know, a hundred different ways. Um, the potential impact of this is huge. Uh, just to put it in context, uh, the prior panel talked about um, $160 billion of mortgage-backed securities transactions uh, that contain false information. <coughs> LIBOR is used uh, uh, in connection with $350 trillion <coughs> of transactions. Anything, everything from uh, uh, mortgage rates to a whole slew of derivatives, um, and just about any you know uh, exotic financial instrument you can think of is tied to LIBOR. That's why uh, Jeff referred to it as perhaps the most important number in the world. So we have a, a clear wrong uh, by individuals and institutions having an enormous financial impact on a on a very broadly you know spread um, set of uh, institutions and individuals. <coughs> and so clearly. Uh, everybody thinks that those people who are harmed about it ought to get their money back, right? And, and, and what we find, as with the mortgage-backed securities, is it's not that easy. And even though we have enforcement efforts around the world, which are collecting billions of dollars, those dollars do not find their way back into the pockets of the people who are actually harmed. So um, uh, I'm going to talk about some of the causes of action that um, that people are using, and, and, and Steve talked about some of them, and why they're not designed uh, to handle uh, this kind of situation. Um, this is a highly unusual set of facts, uh, and, and, um, and for that reason, when you apply the legal principles that have evolved over time under these different causes of action, they don't fit. It's kind of like a square peg in a, in a round hole. <laughs> And um, Steve and others are, 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 are working hard to figure out how to, how to do that, um, and, and it's challenging. Um, so for, in any civil claim, of course, you're going to have um, several hurdles you have to meet. You have to prove liability, whether it's a federal securities law claim or a common law contract claim or a state law <coughs> fraud claim. You're going to have to satisfy each of the individual elements. And, and as I indicated, there are uh, problems with each of those with this very peculiar set of facts. If you get past the liability stage, then you have to show causation and damages. That is, that you personally, institution or individual, <coughs> suffered a direct harm that you can tie back to that violation of law. And there are hurdles with respect to those, even if you get past the liability hurdles. So I'm just going to. Um, go briefly over some of the main problems that people are facing here, and then maybe Steve can talk about some of the strategies that people are using to deal with them. So um, when, uh, when lawyers first hear that somebody has given false information about, a, you know, uh, about uh, an information that's tied to a security, you know, whether it be an equity or debt instrument, typically the first place their, their brain goes is um, uh, the uh, federal or state securities laws, which are almost all predicated upon a misrepresentation either in connection with the, a proxy or a uh, open market purchase or sale of, of the security. Um, and, uh, and that is one of the causes of action that you see coming up. Um, the problem with that is you t typically need to have a misrepresentation, typically by the seller, of a security in connection with the um, underlying uh, financial or economic information about that. Um, most of the people who were impacted by LIBOR did not have a direct purchase and sale relationship with the banks who were involved in it. Some did, and I'll get to that in a second. But um, you, 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 um, if, if you are simply buying an instrument from somebody else that's tied to LIBOR and are hurt by it, you can't point to a misrepresentation necessarily um, that in, in, in direct relationship with one of the banks that was involved in this. Um, there certainly are a lot of um, institutions who bought from uh, these uh, the banks that were involved in, in setting LIBOR, um, but then you have to be able to point to a specific misrepresentation that you relied upon in doing that. And, 
Um, there's one case, I think it was Barclays, where they pointed to um, a uh, misrepresentation that the, the bank is a good corporate citizen, and, and therefore you can rely on them. Well, most courts require something much more specific than that. You know, they require uh, something to the effect in these circumstances that um, you know LIBOR is set in this way, when in fact the bank knew that it was not submitting legitimate rates. So, so there are a set of facts that uh, can support that type of claim. But as you can see, it's a, a a narrower set of facts than the very generalized. You know, I I um, I bought an instrument and got paid a lower interest rate on it because these banks out there fix LIBOR. Um, common law fraud claims uh, don't have some of the constraints that the federal securities law claims, which have a number of hoops <coughs> that you have to jump through, but they still have the requirement of a misstatement that was relied upon by the buyer. And um, uh, those, um, those are a very specific set of facts. Um, there are some kind of one-off statutes that are more particularized that do open up the possibility of liability. One of them that came up in the New York litigation was the Commodities Exchange uh, uh, Act, which specifically addressed manipulation in the commodities markets. And of course, a lot of these derivative instruments qualify as commodities traded on the commodities exchanges. So moving beyond fraud, um, uh, when it came to light um, that, uh, that there was actually some cooperation between the banks, or conspiracy, if you want to use a more loaded term, I could almost hear the plaintiff's bar, you know, uh, get excited, right? Because, because this is being important. Oh, OK. <laughs> um, antitrust claims are inherently difficult because it's very often to, uh, very difficult to prove that there was a conspiracy, that there was actually agreement among uh, uh, different um, entities. Um, and, but once you have that agreement, which the, um, the regulators found here, uh, it, it, it tends to be uh, much easier to prove your case. The problem here is that the antitrust law, at least in the US, has developed such that it's only designed to focus on a very particular set of behaviors in markets. There's case law that goes back decades that deal with the issue of antitrust injury and antitrust standing. Su such that um, they will only focus on uh, agreements or conspiracies among competitors that limit competition in a market and, um, and will only give standing to consumers in those markets who uh, suffer as a result. And it's typically you pay a higher price because the competitors who you're trying to buy from have fixed the price. Um, the, um, anti the antitrust um, case that Steve referred to was dismissed because of a lack of antitrust standing. And it's a, it's a very interesting issue because, in fact, the LIBOR banks were not competing with respect to setting the LIBOR price. But they were arguably competing with each other to sell securities based upon LIBOR and benefited as a result of that conspiracy. So the Second Circuit, I, th I think, is going to be hearing a very interesting argument and one of first impression, as far as I know, as to whether kind of that second level, uh, one step removed from the actual competition and the conspiracy in that area will give rise to uh, an antitrust claim. Um, I'll talk for a second about uh, causation and damages and then, then kick it back. If you can establish liability under any of these theories, you've got to show, as I indicated, that your injury was caused by the particular violation. Really hard to do here, uh, in part because you had so many banks contributing to LIBOR. So it's very hard to figure out what the LIBOR rate would have been had the banks given truthful information. The other thing that really complicates this, and Steve mentioned it, is the banks were lying in both directions. So sometimes it suited their interest to give a lower rate than they actually thought that they could um, borrow at because they wanted to signal to the market that they were healthier than they actually were. And you do that by saying, people will lend me money cheap. <laughs> and, and, and so banks that were in trouble would typically use these as signals to the market. Of course, a lot of these banks made money getting paid interest 
based on LIBOR, and so they were incentivized economically to move LIBOR up. So, um, so you have you have the um, the fix going in different directions, and then just to add another complication to it, many of the instruments out there that are tied to LIBOR are reset periodically. So you not only have to figure out what the LIBOR rate should have been when the instrument was issued, but at every time it was reset in order to calculate through what the, uh, what the uh, end result damage is. And, and Steve has come up uh, with some approaches to dealing with those issues. But uh, my point is to just give a sense of, you know, the real hurdles facing plaintiffs trying to get um, uh, recoveries uh, in the civil litigation system. Why don't we, uh, why don't we uh, add to the um, set of issues that are now on the table by turning to Dan and then uh, 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 to Andrew um, from their perspectives and then we'll um, uh, have further discussion from the panelists. Uh, thank you very much to uh, Jeff. You want to stand here? Or? I like the sitting down moment, uh, to be honest. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you to Jeff and the organizers uh, for putting on this <coughs> event. Uh, as Jeff said at the outset, uh, I teach uh, law and finance uh, at Oxford. Uh, so I'm here to bridge uh, two gaps. Uh, one is the transatlantic gap between what's happening with the litigation in the US uh, and what's happening with the litigation uh, in the UK. And the other is the law and finance gap uh, because uh, both myself uh, and Andrew uh, have uh, engaged in research on the governance of LIBOR uh, and how we might be able to uh, improve it. Uh, so perhaps I'll start uh, by talking a little bit about uh, the litigation uh, in the UK. Uh, and I'll set this against the backdrop of two big differences between the US uh, and the UK. Uh, the first is the effective absence of the class action uh, in the United <coughs> Kingdom uh, as a mechanism for private parties to seek redress. Uh, the second uh, is that uh, all of this took place, uh, the uh, settlements and the subsequent litigation uh, have taken place against the backdrop of the uh, Financial Conduct Authority's investigation and subsequent compensation scheme for mis-selling of interest rate and other swaps. Uh, this investigation was announced prior to uh, the revelations about LIBOR, but the subsequent revelations and settlements about LIBOR have led to uh, a rethink, if you will, of the way that uh, that uh, particular uh, scheme is being approached. Uh, the first two cases to come before uh, the UK courts uh, are the case in Graysley Properties and Barclays, uh, commonly uh, referred to, uh, especially if you're plaintiff's counsel, uh, as the Guardian Care Homes case. Always good to have uh, old folks' homes uh, on the plaintiff's side uh, from a, a PR perspective. Uh, and the second is Deutsche Bank uh, v. Unitec. Uh, these cases share a number of uh, similarities. Uh, first, they're both at the procedural stages, uh, as is much of the litigation here in the US. Uh, both involve uh, credit facilities to which were attached uh, interest rate swaps, uh, as you will often, or as you'd expect to see in many transactions. Uh, and both of these uh, suits were actually launched uh, prior to uh, the DOJ, CFTC, uh, and then FSA's investigations and settlements with Barclays and other banks in LIBOR. And as a result, what we've actually seen so far is uh, an attempt in both of those cases to amend the statement of claims to include additional claims on the basis of facts that came out of the regulatory proceedings. That is what we're seeing is factual piggybacking uh, off of uh, the public investigations. Uh, beyond these uh, facial similarities, however, the two cases are actually quite uh, different, both in terms of their facts uh, and in terms of what's been pled. And so I thought I would start by uh, uh, canvassing uh, some of those issues briefly. So in Graysley, the original claim was one for innocent, innocent misrepresentation, so a tort claim, uh, effectively, uh, and the plaintiff sought rescission uh, of that contract. Uh, and again, uh, what we've seen so far in terms of actual jurisprudence on this is this, the then subsequent attempt to amend the pleadings. Uh, and this is a very low test in the UK. Basically, if you've got an arguable case uh, that has a prospect of succeeding, uh, you're in. Uh, and in Graysley, uh, they have indeed uh, gotten in and satisfied that test. Interestingly, the judge in that case, Justice Flo, uh, focused uh, much uh, of his attention on what the traders who manipulated the rates and the senior management 
knew about the contracts that the plaintiff was entering into. So did they know that if manipulation is taking place within uh, the interest rate swap market, that this would feed into the, the cash flows uh, on the loan agreements uh, and whatnot? Uh, ultimately, uh, this came down uh, at this stage, the idea that, well, counterparties have a right to assume that if they're engaged in business with banks that are part of the LIBOR uh, panel banks and use LIBOR, that uh, there won't be any uh, jiggery pokery uh, going on between the two. Unitech, uh, in contrast, and this is one of those great cases where bad facts have the potential to make some really bad law, uh, wasn't originally uh, a case having anything to do with swap mis-selling. Uh, Unitech uh, got blown out, uh, couldn't pay back its loans, and is attempting to use uh, LIBOR misrepresentation as a shield against having to pay back money to Deutsche Bank. So already, uh, uh, the lawyers in the room might be able to predict uh, how this case uh, has been dealt with. Here, it, it was a more uh, uh, a, doctrine, a traditional doctrinal approach to uh, the issues at hand. Importantly, the pleadings in this case were actually contractual in nature. So it was an implied uh, 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 warranty claim or a collateral warranty claim uh, seeking uh, basically uh, contractual settlement. Here the judge wasn't particularly sympathetic on the leave to amend application to uh, then uh, add on a negligent and fraudulent misrepresentation in tort, uh, and said that uh, it was simply going to be unrealistic uh, for everybody who has uh, a transaction linked to LIBOR to also have to their benefit uh, some sort of implied warranty that LIBOR works. That is to say, or as the judge said it, uh, that it's unrealistic to think that when Barclays or Deutsche Bank goes out into the world and makes this implied representation, that they can speak for the entire LIBOR system uh, and whether it works properly. Now, both of these uh, motions uh, are currently before uh, the Court of Appeal uh, and will likely be decided together. Uh, as I said to some people last night, with my luck, uh, that decision is probably coming out uh, at this exact moment, and everything that I'm telling you is now yesterday's news. Uh, so look out uh, to those. In terms of the actual trials, the only trial scheduled so far is the Graysley uh, trial, which is scheduled for six weeks uh, next April. So we are still very much at a preliminary stage. One of the most interesting, so getting to the substantive content of these claims, uh, the most interesting thing coming out of this is whether uh, plaintiffs are going to have a tougher road to hoe with the contractual claims or the tort claims. Uh, and here on the contract side, again, we're talking about uh, implied uh, warranties uh, and collateral warranties. On the tort side, we're talking about misrepresentations of varying degrees of severity. The basic test uh, in the UK uh, for both is pretty simple, or at least similar, uh, and that's whether a reasonable person would have inferred uh, that uh, a representation was being made, one of those nasty objective subjective tests. But the courts in each of the two cases we have so far took a very dramatic, a, a dramatically different approach uh, to that question. As I said before, Flo uh, in Graysley focused on the idea of what the bank traders and managers knew uh, in terms of making the connections between manipulation and the loss uh, to counterparties. Uh, Cook, uh, in the Unitech case, uh, took a much more uh, traditional English approach uh, and said, well, let's focus on the representee and what they would have inferred uh, from uh, the words and deeds of uh, the banks in question. Because Flo was focusing on uh, fraud uh, in the former case, it seems to make sense that uh, on an intuitive level that they would have focused on the knowledge of uh, bank managers, if that's going to be ultimately uh, an issue that they have to satisfy the court uh, about. Even more important than the basic test, though, is ultimately what kind of damages can you get out of this? Uh, and here uh, is where one, uh, where the tort claims, at least under English law, would seem to be more desirable um, not only can you get uh, a relatively uh, decent amount of damages out of it, but at least for the plaintiffs so far, rescission has been the name of the game. What they want is to be put back in a position as though they never entered the contract. They don't want to mess with a lot of the, the issues uh, that, uh, in terms of causation and damages uh, that uh, seem to be raised uh, in the UK, or sorry, in the US. Uh, the rescission uh, in the UK, in addition to actually uh, being able to walk away from the contract, will entitle you to things like your break costs. Uh, so uh, we can immediately see that uh, these sort of claims are advantageous. 
Ultimately, then, uh, the difference between tort and contract leads to substantially different evidentiary challenges uh, under each type of claim. Uh, so on the contract side, the big question is going to be the but for. What does this market look like if LIBOR is not manipulated? Because you're going to be entitled to the difference between uh, what actually happened uh, and that counterfactual. There's also, uh, I think, important questions about causation and the extrapolation of losses uh, over broader periods. Uh, and for those of you that were familiar with this, uh, some of these issues harken back to me to some of the claims uh, on the uh, mutual fund uh, market timing cases where you had huge evidentiary issues about having to extrapolate damages based on when you were in line. <coughs> On the tort side, uh, in contrast, we're still dealing with a but-for test, but the but-for is, well, what would the, the party receiving the representation have done uh, had they known, uh, or had this representation not been made? This goes back to the nature of the, the damages award uh, for rescission, uh, and here the parties really have to satisfy that they turned their mind to the issue, uh, and that this became something that was sufficiently salient to them that they wouldn't have entered into the transaction had this implied uh, uh, representation ultimately not been made. Uh, going forward, I think it's safe to say that there's a divergence of views uh, whether these claims are going to be successful in the UK. Uh, I think that uh, you know, on the balance, uh, the evidentiary challenges for both the contractual and tort claims uh, and the general sort of uh, program that uh, English lawyers put to uh, uh, well, or the value that they put in freedom of contract, uh, let's say, means that it, it, it's a tough uphill uh, challenge for both Unitec and Grayley. Other parties are waiting on the sidelines, awaiting the outcome of these two trials, awaiting uh, to see whether the FCA uh, uh, swap and selling uh, scheme actually uh, works. Uh, so we may see more litigation depending on uh, how uh, successful those uh, actions ultimately are. I'll say something very quickly about the mis-selling probes uh, themselves, because uh, it goes to something that Jeff said earlier on. Uh, the UK actually has a history uh, of substituting private litigation in the securities and financial law fields with uh, these public uh, sort of schemes. Uh, the most recent one, uh, other than the swap mis-selling scheme, is the, the, uh, the PPI, or Payment Protection Insurance, uh, scheme where we had uh, hundreds of thousands of claimants claiming billions of dollars uh, of losses, and that process has proceeded fairly smoothly. The swap mis-selling scheme has not proceeded smoothly at all. Uh, the scheme was announced in the spring of 2012. It potentially involves 30,000 different separate claims, uh, most of which uh, have not moved forward, so the, the FCA has a process which has whittled down the actual actionable claims to about 10,000. Of that 10,000, uh, 32 settlement offers have been put out to date uh, for a total of two million pounds. Uh, and to put that in perspective, uh, the biggest four UK banks have put aside uh, hundreds of millions of pounds uh, for payouts uh, under this scheme. Uh, and a year and a half later, we're still uh, dribs and drabs. And of those 32 offers, only two have been accepted uh, by the claimants. All right, so very uh, briefly then, and then I'll turn it over to Andrew, uh, who's gonna speak about these types of issues more, in more depth. How did we get here? Uh, and as a former practitioner, I always get kind of jazzed about questions uh, where uh, my experience in practice and uh, the way that academics uh, uh, view the world in theory uh, diverge remarkably. Uh, the prevailing academic view to the extent that people even thought about uh, indices and other private market structures uh, prior to these sort of problems was that market participants had pretty powerful incentives to fix any problems uh, due to market-based reputational sanctions. The reality of LIBOR was that I think anybody uh, who had a job that remotely looked like uh, mine in the 1990s and early 2000s knew two things. One, LIBOR was not an accurate reflection of bank borrowing costs. Two, it was possible that it was being manipulated. There wasn't sufficient governance in place to stop that from happening. That raises a big question. How did we get here? How did the market not work to solve this problem before it got to the point that it did? Uh, and here, uh, we can ultimately look to, uh, I think, three uh, uh, potential market failures or frictions, uh, which inhibited the sort of uh, fixing that we would, uh, the sort of Bayesian updating that we would expect to observe in markets uh, in these sort of circumstances. The first were huge information problems. 
if not for the crisis and the fact that investment bankers can't seem to get their head around the idea that text messages exist in the ether and that they will come back and haunt you, we're not here today discussing LIBOR. If it wasn't for the fact that spreads on all other indices of interbank borrowing blew out during the crisis and LIBOR didn't, the Wall Street Journal wouldn't have written an article that said, hey, wait a minute, that seems weird. The British Bankers Association wouldn't have launched an investigation which the next day led, predictably, LIBOR rates to jump up to reflect uh, more closely other measures of interbank lending. And if uh, uh, the hubris of investment bankers uh, thinking that they would never get caught for writing text messages didn't happen, none of this takes place. This is because uh, of issues uh, that Andrew has touched on in his paper relating to the incredible discretion that was built into LIBOR, which made it very difficult to verify. Uh, and also because a lot of the markets in which the uh, LIBOR were used, was used uh, were not themselves uh, particularly transparent. The second and third issues are really positive network externalities uh, and the fact that LIBOR was bundled together with other goods and services which you couldn't get anywhere else. So try talking to your bank uh, when you're going to get a loan and maybe a related swap agreement and saying, I'd rather not use LIBOR, thanks. I've got my own uh, funky little uh, uh, measure of interest rate borrowing. You can imagine how that conversation uh, is going to go. And we know, or no, always a strong word, intuitively this would seem to uh, uh, cause us to question uh, whether there were significant barriers to entry that would allow competitors to LIBOR to come in and supplant it. And it's interesting in that respect that there was actually uh, alternative rates that existed that were never used. Uh, so there was LIBID, which solves one of the problems with LIBOR, which is the fact that it was simply the offered rate and not the rate uh, at which transactions actually happened. Uh, there's also various uh, repo indices uh, that can be, from an informational perspective, perform largely uh, a similar function. Ultimately, uh, these sort of questions uh, raise, or, or at least, um, uh, hit on uh, questions of whether uh, the governance uh, of LIBOR uh, was adequate. Clearly it seems uh, it wasn't. And then uh, what to do about it. Uh, and here, uh, perhaps we'll save that uh, until questions become cognizant uh, of time. One final point is simply that uh, this basic construct, this idea that for a lot of private market structures, uh, we rely on uh, the intuition uh, or the, the do section ex machina of the market uh, is something that we need to rethink. Uh, it's not just LIBOR, it's not just financial indices, uh, it's things uh, in my view, for example, like uh, the determination committee mechanism used to adjudicate credit events and credit default swaps, which manifest many of the same characteristics of LIBOR uh, and going forward are things that we need to pay attention to, uh, less we really having a panel with the Global Justice Forum uh, in future years talking about the manipulation of the different market structures. Uh, so with that, uh, thank you. Great. Um, and Andrew. <clears throat> thank you. Uh, so um, why, why, again, does this matter? We've, we've heard that this is the world's biggest and most important number LIBOR, but I, I would like to broaden the perspective to, to, uh, in terms of policy and, and sort of social critique of what we're really talking about here and, and what we should be thinking about going forward. Um, Price discovery, or if you will, price formation, are or is the most important concept um, that capitalism has going for it. Uh, it's, the, it's the base rock, it's the base from which the rest of our free market uh, progresses. Um, and, um, and in our society, in our market society, the way that prices come about is through price indicators, price indices, price benchmarks. That's how we do it. It doesn't have to be that way, but it's how prices emerge. If you want to know the price of oil, the price of interest, the price of your how much your retirement fund is worth, whether you can afford to go to Europe for a vacation, what the exchange rate is, what electricity costs, uh, all these things, you're going to look to a price indicator, whether or not you know it, a price index of some kind. And um, that's how we do it in this society. We, we therefore, uh, should care a lot if these indicators are accurate, if they're manipulated, um, if they are biased. Uh, we should care in part because uh, certain individuals could be materially harmed as a result of a discrepancy. If currency rates at the index point are off, you will get a different amount from your ATM in Europe than you thought you would. Um, or your oil prices will be too high or low, leading to an inefficient allocation of society's scarce wealth. But it also matters in a more, in a sort of 
deeper way. Um, if you looked up LIBOR in a finance textbook, people would talk about it there as though it were the price of money or the risk-free rate, not a representation thereof. And if you, I, I've got a paper that I'm, I'm working on about this, where you, if you were to go through uh, judicial opinions looking at indices, like LIBOR, but other ones, like Platt's crude oil benchmarks, or uh, the uh, world markets foreign exchange uh, indicators, currencies, commodities, interest rates. Courts don't just act like these are an important indication of the price. They act like they are the price. This isn't just a representation. This is the thing itself, the platonic real thing we're seeing. So if that's not the case, uh, something is deeply implicated in how our system is, is operating. Um, and I would suggest that uh, LIBOR is part of a, a category of institutions that all serve this function and that are all susceptible to certain risks that we need to be conscious of and design our system to prevent going forward. Um, that's why this is important, but implicit in that claim is a disagreement with something that a lot of people take for granted. I think that we shouldn't take for granted that LIBOR was a unique aberration, that its structure was so rotten that this was inevitable, and that LIBOR is so different from every other index out there. It's easy to come to that view. As I talk about in my paper, LIBOR had some features that are really surprising. This is a subjective system where traders are making a guess about their ability to borrow, or the bank is making a guess about their ability to borrow. They don't have to present real data. They don't have to base the decision on real data. Uh, and it's, uh, it's an opaque submission that, is, that other people can't verify or, or know where it's coming from. And it's made by people uh, who, uh, who um, maybe have uh, skin in the game on, on one side or another. This is very surprising. It would be easy to single these features out as uh, truly uh, aberrant and problematic. Um, and I think that's too easy. So I think that's too easy because those features, call them subjectivity and opacity for two catch terms, uh, are neither necessary nor sufficient for index problems. They're not necessary for index problems because you have financial indices that exhibit disruptions and <coughs> alleged ma manipulations that have neither of those features. Currency rates, if you want to know your exchange rate of yen to euros, you're probably going to look to something like the world market's uh, Thomson Reuters rate. It's, a, it's the number one uh, currency uh, exchange rate uh, uh, index. It's written in all the financial derivatives. And it's under investigation by, among others, the Swiss regulators for manipulation. Um, and it isn't opaque. And it isn't subjective. And it isn't, it's based on market transactions that are freely observable. Um, the reality is that indices can be manipulated um, regardless of their structure. The structure just constrains who can manipulate them and how. An, an index that has lots of subjectivity and opacity built in allows insiders to manipulate it. An index that doesn't allows outsiders to manipulate it and disempowers the index provider to use subjectivity and opacity to stop outsider manipulation. So there's no, um, there's no necessity of, the, of these features for manipulation. Likewise, they're not sufficient. We, uh, we should intuitively know that because notwithstanding uh, market understandings that LIBOR was a little fishy in the 90s, um, LIBOR satisfactorily uh, did its job since the mid 80s. And people, people, I think, even people who thought it was something fishy didn't think it was quite so fishy until the middle of, this cent um, of the last decade. But LIBOR had these features though since the mid 80s. So if it was this tinderbox that was ready to go off, why did it take until 2005 or 2007 or 2009 for it to go off? And though we can make a list of other indices that rhyme with LIBOR, like TIBOR, which is the Tokyo Interbank Rate, rate and uh, CYBOR for Singapore, or URIBOR for Europe, that have had allegations of problems, there are, is a list twice as long of bores that haven't been alleged to have a problem, that have similar governance structures. Um, so if this structure is, uh, is sufficient for manipulation, why haven't we seen that there? I, I would suggest that it's neither necessary nor sufficient. If you identify these features of sub subjectivity and opacity that LIBOR had, you do get a history of how LIBOR went wrong, allegedly or admittedly or provenly or whatever. Um, you get a history, but you don't get the explanation. The explanation <coughs> is that 
Um, in all index construction, there are trade-offs. There's no one right structure that is the best structure for all indices or that minimizes all risks necessarily. Um, each index structure just poses different risks. And the question is, given your structure, uh, have, you, have you dealt with the risks that it creates? Um, and for LIBOR, it, there, there weren't systems to prevent, at least in, in the final days when things mattered, there weren't systems to prevent the, the unique problems that, um, that came out of the structure. Um, so what can, we, what can we draw from the assertions that I just made? One thing is that because LIBOR doesn't prove the proposition that there are two or three things that can go wrong with an index, we, we can just get rid of them, it removes from us the easiest uh, public policy solution that people want to suggest. The easiest public policy solution is regulate indices and require them to operate in certain ways, certain ways that don't look like LIBOR. Um, and that's a proposal that in various forms is, uh, is attractive to regulators in, in every country that's looking at this problem. Uh, and I don't, think that that's a, I don't think that's a viable strategy because I think that every index is different and should be, and there's no one way that is the best way. And um, so there's no, there, you can't have a command and control solution here that minimizes problems. You can only regulate which problems you want to face. Um, I think it might be better to uh, provide proper incentives for market participants to choose the structures that work for them and then control risks. Um, and that means understanding that in our society where price discovery does happen through indices, a lot of these indices are privately provided. They're provided by for-profit firms. And when you're dealing with for-profit firms, you want to provide a system that gives them the right incentives to do a good job with it. Those incentives weren't in place for LIBOR. With LIBOR, um, we arguably had carrots and arguably had sticks. But I think we need to have certainly <coughs> carrots and certainly sticks for index providers. And what I mean by that is this. Um, the LIBOR banks or their traders or whatever are, uh, are being sued right now and maybe they'll win, maybe they'll lose, and you know, maybe they'll pay out more in settlements to governments and that's no fun. But I think everyone will agree that these are tough cases to litigate and in a lot of countries, um, the laws are even less favorable than the United States to, uh, to prosecuting such violations. So we need clear sticks uh, that, are, uh, that, are, that are better for dealing with these problems than we, than we had or than we have. We also need carrots, though. Um, to my mind, one of the most important pieces of the puzzle is that if you're an index provider, um, you have uncertain ability to monetize your index in a honest way. Um, the LIBOR banks and the BBA could monetize LIBOR by manipulating it, either for reputational benefit or to pay off on their swaps. That's an illegitimate way to monetize their creation. Um, and, and they have to trade that off against the expected litigation costs. But I would like a world in which they had clear uh, ways to monetize it honestly. Um, and that world is probably not the one that we live in because the intellectual property rights that allow an index provider to charge those who would use it are relatively uncertain at this time. If you produce something like LIBOR and you want to charge, um, uh, 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 you want to charge a commodities exchange for, or an options exchange for writing financial derivatives based on it, uh, as after all the majority of the world's derivatives by value are based on LIBOR. If you want to charge the people who are making use of this product you publish, um, in the United States you have much weaker abilities to do that than you did uh, even 10 years ago, um, and certainly 20 years ago. 20 years ago you could clearly charge um, a, a reasonable royalty for the exchange data traded derivatives that profit from your, from your uh, productive uh, service of producing this price. But increasingly um, the Second Circuit is uh, cutting back on the power, the legal right of index providers to exclude people from its use if they don't pay some small royalty for it. And I think that's not a good trend. I think that we're, um, we're it, it may be that LIBOR manipulation happened for many reasons, but one, one of them might be that it happened at the same time as the intellectual property rights that honest monetization of LIBOR involved were disappearing in the United States. And even more so in Europe and the UK. Um, the rights are even weaker over there. So I would suggest that as we take a step back and realize 
um, for the first time how important price indicators are to our society, how closely they're written into the DNA of our market capitalism, that we need to have good public policy to encourage them to operate well in the future. Some part of that means having good litigation and criminal, nobody's mentioned criminal, but criminal enforcement for those who would do wrong. But some part of it also means uh, providing incentives so that those who provide them have something to gain from doing a good job. Um, there's no competition for LIBOR that was successful, in part because if you competed with LIBOR, all you got was the right to be sued later, okay? But uh, if you had intellectual property rights that were worth billions of dollars for, for grabbing this market share, that might be a nice reason to have a market solution to this problem. And I, I think that that is probably a more attractive choice than uh, creating a command and control regime that may or may not fix uh, the problems in one index uh, uh, on the basis of another. Okay, um, I think it's uh, been a terrific um, uh, exploration of U.S. Um, of litigation, U.S., U.K., some of the deep policy issues. Um, uh, Steve, let's come back to you for um, a minute. And, and, and so as, as, as somebody who's try, trying to litigate these cases, um, first of all, uh, how do you judge the prospects of ultimately getting relief, and, and secondly, um, I mean, I wonder if you might respond a little bit to what Andrew has suggested, that um, um, uh, if we let the LIBOR folks, in effect, charge for use of it, that uh, given what you observe about how market behavior occurs, whether you think that would be um, a way to uh, discourage this manipulation. Well, as for prospects, uh, 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 Bill Butterfield, who is one of the class lawyers in the case, is, is looking at me going, what's the answer? Um, I, look, I think that uh, one thing that's cons that I agree with that's come out of all the conversation is that the civil litigation, the plaintiffs, and I think the court are looking for the right legal theory, the right, the right remedy for the wrongful conduct. I mean, one of the things that's interesting about Judge Buckwell's decision is that she did, she did not dispute that um, we sufficiently pleaded that there was a conspiracy to suppress LIBOR. Um, she did not conclude that our allegations of this conspiracy to suppress LIBOR were not plausible, which is the standard. Um, she moved past that. Um, and so I think, um, you know, uh, it's, it's a, it's a, right now we're at a place where we need to figure out the lawyers, and I think the court too, is trying to figure out the right legal theory, the, like, the right style of remedy uh, for this particular uh, course of conduct. Um, and if I can just for one minute, uh, you know, what's interesting is, one of the things that Mike mentioned, the possibility of securities claims here. Um, the, the lawyers who filed these cases came essentially to the same conclusion that Mike did, which is that you could not sufficiently plead a securities claim, and their securities claims have not been part of the case. However, our judge threw out the, the RICO claim in large part on her conclusion that we could have asserted a securities claim, and therefore something called the RICO amendment uh, to, the federal, to the PSLRA applied, barring the RICO claim. So it puts, again, you know, figuring out the right remedy, the plaintiff's lawyers, and there's dozens and dozens of cases filed, and nobody filed this claim. This is, a, this is a legal claim that we spent a lot of time talking about whether or not to assert. And the lawyers concluded not to assert it. The judge said, well, maybe you should have because I'm throwing out your RICO claim because there's a claim here that you didn't bring. Um, I think with respect to fraud claims, um, it might be slightly different for, for example, my client, it's individual clients who might be able to present specific facts of fraud that may be more difficult in other contexts. Um, the antitrust issue is going to be, is the hot issue, and it's the issue that's going to the Second Circuit. And I just, just so we understand the, the, the issue, we say the conspiracy to fix LIBOR Right, so, uh, uh, um, LIBOR is a component of the price of a LIBOR-based instrument. So you buy a LIBOR-based bond. The LIBOR is a component of that because it's determining the interest rate. And the, har the harm to competition is the harm to competition in the market for those instruments. That's a theory that the judge um, did not follow. 
Um, she did not focus on it, I don't think, and I think ultimately, to answer your question, I think we will prevail in the Second Circuit. Um, causation and damages is always challenging in any of these cases. Um, there's a couple scholars here who've done a lot of work on damages models. They're still here. Um, but, um, you know, there are benchmarks, pretty clear uh, benchmarks, that show a deviation between what LIBOR should have been during the suppression period, mind you, not during any extended period, but during the suppression period. There are benchmarks that are used in the industry, um, and LIBOR deviates from those significantly um, downward. And to put it simply, the, the loss is going to be, the damage is going to be, what the investor should have received and did not receive. Um, and it does require a, a daily look at what LIBOR was and a daily look at benchmarks, but that's, um, that's very doable. Um, it's very doable. Um, as for charging for the use, I, I, don't, I'm, I don't think I'm really qualified to answer that question. I, I would say, I don't know that it matters. I mean, the, there, were, there was motivation here for, during the suppression period, the motivation was for the, the financial institutions to appear more solvent and stronger than they really were. Um, by, if they had reported their actual borrowing costs, which were higher, it would have made them look weaker. They were not going to do that. They suppressed those rates so they would look financially stronger. If they were paying for the privilege of using LIBOR, would they have not made that choice? I don't think so. If I might make one comment on that, it's just, I mean, you know, I do back at the envelope math in my paper and suggest that Citi might have had $10 billion a year in revenue if they were to charge a very tiny amount um, on the use of LIBOR. That would be uh, the kind of money that you might install you know, security to check your you know, text messages of your employees to make sure they weren't screwing up that revenue stream. Uh, and you'd be in less financial trouble to lie about if you had that kind of revenue stream. And so anyway, otherwise, I'll, I'll there we go. Uh, Michael, a different question for you. And, and so, um, uh, again, the LIBOR scandal uh, involved a suppression period in which all the banks acted together to keep the rates lower to project a, a sense of greater financial stability. And then there were the uh, periods in which traders were trying trying to change the rate to, uh, to make uh, money on their own books. So, but let's focus on the, and, except it's been the suppression period which is the focus of litigation. S suppose it's the case that um, uh, senior officials at the Bank of England um, and senior officials at the Fed were well aware of the fact that the reported rates were lower than um, alternative rates in money markets because, in fact, banks didn't lend to one another at all uh, considerably in this period, right? That was one of the, the, uh, one of the fallout is that the um, uh, um, interbank lending rate, particularly in Europe, went way down. And, and so let's assume that um, there was knowledge or implicit knowledge on the part of the Fed and the part of the Bank of England. So what does that do to an argument about um, how the private litigation system uh, should try to hold uh, these, these financial institutions to account? Well, I think uh, if and to the extent the regulators knew that there was an issue that these spreads didn't make sense, then you've got a huge failure on the regulatory front, just like you did with the mortgage-backed securities. Um, I don't think, however, that that should um, protect uh, the banks in civil suits um, uh, 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 in which uh, the, you know, the suppression of the, um, the rate is being attacked. It's not a defense to say, yeah, I was doing it, but the regulators knew I was doing it, so it's okay. Um, in the back, yeah. Yeah. Um, actually, the mic will work. Yes. Okay, good. Um, the two gentlemen on the right side and I are bankers. So we start banking business and we collaborate. We meet once a week for coffee and we have this live world, we call it tribal, and set up and set up a tool. Nothing else on the market available. So the rest of us, all here, all bankers say, well, let's use, this, let's use that tool. So it's not imposed by us, it's not offered by us. It's picked up because nothing else available. So you, if you come to situations where somebody in our banks, in the 
criminal intent changes, modifies, manipulates, then you have a case. But if you just say, well, we just meet once a week over coffee, and we just theoretically have happening. We can see in, in, in German education, on the, on the horizon, um, what's happening there? I mean, where are we then? A full wash would, I guess, be not impossible. But then, then be impossible. You only have to organize a single case. Is that correct? Uh, yeah. It would make it harder than basically to come to an overall um, compressing approach. To these issues. It, it, it is difficult to come up with a system that works. There is nothing wrong with privately putting together a system um, that creates a benchmark. The problem is if the, the process and the result are not what they're represented to be to the market. Yeah, but the problem is, um, sorry, the problem is if these, all these vendors take voluntarily this not provable, as it made it very clear, not verifiable, <laughs> you, can you can manipulate it all times. This, this tool in your hand, and you use it for your own activities. And the responsibility is part of your hands, right or not? That's going to be a, that's going to be a problem. If, 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 if others outside of the banks are relying on it, and you know they're relying on it. I'm relying that my mechanic does a decent job with my car, with my brakes. <laughs> That's not good enough. I might run against the next tree, then what? Well, I think, and, and, and I was having a discussion earlier about the, the governance obligation of an, of an organization that creates uh, these kind of rates. We fully agree, but that wasn't there. Yeah. You correct? You confirm that it wasn't there. The, what? Nobody the, bothered to do something. They just brought it up. Simple yeah. example. One person today has brown shoes on, everybody else in black shoes. So we'll change it now over time. So we all come in black with brown shoes. So we're going to go for conference, it's brown shoes. It's like a mask. It's a self imposed theory, concept. We fall for that. It so is true that. We very rigid. So is there something we can grab and say, this was really manipulation? Hey, it's like the Deutsche Bank, for example, saying that, well, this was just six subsidiary people there. It's not us. It is true that, of course, LIBOR's history is that it didn't emerge as something that was intended for broad public consumption. Right. Uh, these were small cliques of banks that were forming consortia to make syndicated eight loans. Right. What's that? Eight. Well, there, there were just there were many LIBORs. The, the LIBOR as a proper noun with a capital L with a trademark symbol right. doesn't emerge until relative. There are LIBORs all through the 70s. There's no LIBOR until the late 80s. And it's just one of the LIBORs that people begin to glom onto. It doesn't account for a substantial share of non-syndicated lending activity until the mid-90s. Important, important uh, thresholds when the Chicago Mercantile Exchange, or the CBOE, I think, actually, uh, chooses to use the LIBOR rate instead of a LIBOR rate for its Eurodollar futures. It's a gradual process by which the market begins to glom onto it. Um, but I think the consensus is that at some point, at least this LIBOR became something of public importance, either because their web page says that it is a certain way and the market trusts it and you can too, which their web page does and did during the relevant period. Um, maybe that's the hook. But I, in Europe, at least, where they're drafting all this legislation to, to have a comprehensive solution in the continent, in the, continent uh, the you know, there, there's a recognition that merely being something that you know lots of people are using begins to create a public obligation for you. Mm -hmm. But I mean, the issue, the issue was, um, if you said the market just grabbed onto this tool, which was there, the very few ones, we that shows a lot of fair enough. But it was the market which grabbed onto this because nothing else available. So, it was, there was some governmental cuts saying, now we make this new monitor this. So it didn't happen. This is so, very much at the heart of my paper, actually. Uh, it's a bit, I think, incorrect to say that the market grabbed onto the tool. Mm -hmm. The important part to remember is that the market were the banks that made LIBOR, <laughs> right? So it's not as though there was this broad, amorphous, atomized price taker market where everybody just put up their hand and said, that looks good. It's that the people that made the tool insisted that, that it be used in other product markets. Do you do this out? Well, yes, due to their size. I mean, if you looked at the UK, for example, and the amount of commercial lending that's done by the big four, all of which are panel banks on uh, sterling LIBOR, uh, you can make a pretty powerful claim saying that it's difficult to escape the gravity that that creates uh, once the network externalities start to take effect. And you see that in the UK claims insofar as what they're trying to do 
is link the manipulation activities that were taking place at the trader level with the management of the bank and their overall business strategy and uh, their market share. If they succeed, they succeed. If they don't, it's probably because of the problems, or at least partially because of the problems you raised. Uh, uh, Bill. Uh, just to point out, there is a well-known competitor to live mortgage called the H15, which is the uh, treasury rates, the US treasury rates. Those are not theoretical rates. Those are rates that are actually bid and offered in the market. And that's actually physical securities that are traded. Uh, there's actually about seven competitors, I think, between uh, that Andrew and I uh, oh, in our papers. It's there's the question, why don't they show up in any contract? Uh, in my life, I've never seen a live bid linked anything. Um, oh, the live, live bid is shown up, but, but the, 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 the trade <coughs> rates are quoted, they're universal, they're traded all over the world. The U.S. Treasury rate, which you know, is a risk-free rate. Uh, <laughs> uh, Joe, Joe I, I, um, yes. Right. I, I mean, would you say? I, I guess I should ask folks to identify themselves, just just so. Uh, Jennifer Hill. Uh, you, you've spoken about. The, I think you need to use the mic. You've spoken about the asset side, and your client has been not paid the right amount, and you're going back at the bank for that. Well, what about the liability side? There, those people who have LIBOR-based mortgages paid less. So how are you going to prove that the bank, leaving aside the criminals who actually put an email that they did wrong things, the bank didn't necessarily profit in the slightest because its assets and its liabilities were paying at the wrong level. So you really have to go to these guys in their mortgage and say, pony up your five bucks and give it to these guys because you, you can't say the bank uh, in the aggregate has the wrong amount. There's criminals and there is assets and liabilities that the curve was marked down. Not one side of the curve, <coughs> a whole curve. So everything was at the wrong level and you'd also have to probably go back to the shareholders of the banks because the banks were saying they're more solvent than they are because they can borrow at a lower level. So the shareholders' share price was inflated uh, because actually the bank was a little less solvent than it was. So you're going to have to ask those guys for a little bit of money back as well to pay your client. How, how do you do the math on I don't have. Level? I don't have to. So with all respect, I, I don't have to do any of those things that you just said. Um, the I'm issue, not saying you personally. I'm just saying. <laughs> no, I don't think anybody with the I don't think anybody with a plaintiff in one of these cases has to do all those things you just said. I think the issue is what what um, our client was entitled to under the terms of its arrangements and whether it was paid what it was entitled to. It's the whole. That's the whole of it. And if they weren't, they're entitled to recover that money. The issue is the impact on my client, not how much money one of the banks made. Although, although I do think that point comes up elsewhere, and that is what was the intent of the banks. Right. So if they did something that was um, revenue neutral to them, it's a little harder to prove that they did it in order, you know, for, yeah. yes. But, but, but Steve's absolutely right. As a private plaintiff, you don't have to. No, but I'm just saying that the, the bank is then just going to go and sue on the other side. I mean, it's, because they're just going to make the argument that they were not benefited. So. I don't know that we'll make that argument, um, but they may. We're not there yet. They haven't made it in any of the in any of the procedural pleadings. Well, this has been a, a terrific discussion, I think, on a very difficult issue. So, bravo to the panel. Thank you. Thank you.